Let's get one. I'm not going to do that. So, so Pete is, you know, the, the founder of actually one of the uh, the founding uh, uh, principal leaders of this whole effort with TCIPG. You know, if I mean TCIP, if if Pete hadn't been there to bring in all the industry buddies to come and talk with us, it would not have happened. And his connection with industry um, has has served us well all throughout. And he gets to talk about big wires and and beer and. We get to learn listening to him. So, Pete, <laughs> keep All going. Right. Thank you, David. It has been a wonderful time for the last uh, 12 years or so. And this is something I always sort of wanted to do is to talk about the control systems that we use in power systems. But as I was mentioning to Tim uh, in our conference call yesterday, what's missing, and you should, you'll see it's missing, is that there's a layer in between the high level software that we run as engineers and the SCADA hardware and the CTs and the PTs. How does the data get into the computer? How do the control commands get out of the computers? Those things are missing and I would be happy if somebody would, would uh, chime in with something if you want. But I'm going to talk about monitoring and control. And is it supposed to be this button? It was. It was working really hard. All right. No, this one doesn't even work. Uh oh. Oh. Ow. Every now and then it doesn't I don't know. Don't, don't look at me. I don't see that at all. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it needs a new battery. Well, the whole No, I think it's a little Oh, there we go. All right. Oh, okay, there we go. This is who we are. We are Cred C, and uh, this is a huge group of people. <clears throat> I don't know if everybody's online, but this is the largest, well, not quite. As a member of PTERC, we had 13 units. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, 10, 11, 12. And we have, yeah, okay, we do have all them. It's close to being the same size. But that's a lot of uh, faculty, a lot of students, and I hope everybody's online. That'd be great. I'm going to start with this. This is a slide of New England's ISO, the Independent System Operator for the region of New England. And that big board there is something that is sacred to all these control rooms. They all want their map board. And there were days when those map boards were made by hand with little wires, colored stuff, and then Legos. I saw one made out of Legos. But now it's all screens. And I'm going to talk about this, what those screens say and what they do. And uh, I'll start here because this is the most important concept of a power system operating, <coughs> operating as an interconnected grid. I don't have a slide on it, but I think we've already talked about it many times. North America has four grids, east and west, Texas, and Quebec. Each of those operates as a sort of a separate independent grid, but they are interconnected with uh, asynchronous ties. But everybody practices this N minus one security criteria is what it used to be called. But then security started to mean some strange things, uh, so we changed it. It's now called operational reliability. And we still operate in the normal state, which means everything's okay, and you can survive a big long list of accidents. And sometimes the, that list is created by the governor of the state. Sometimes the list is created by the mayor. It's political, it's also technical, but it's, it's one of the rare times when our, our government leaders get involved in the operation of the power grid. They have the authority to tell us, <clears throat> you must be able to survive the loss of this facility. And we add it to our contingency list, and then we, we check it constantly, all day long. If you cannot survive a list of contingencies, but everything's still okay. It's just that if something happens, you're in trouble. That's called the alert state. And you can't stay in the alert state forever. 
If you cannot survive the list of contingencies, you have to redispatch the units so that you can, or take any other control action that you might want. Somehow, by hook or by crook, you have to make the system survive the whole list of contingencies. And when you do, you go back to the normal state. You sit there and wait and keep checking all the time. If something actually happens, that's what, that's the key here on the emergency state. On the emergency state, something actually did happen. I mean, and of the you've lost. Oh, is there a question? Sorry, Pete. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the emergency state is when people get very nervous and you have to make some decisions. And you don't have a lot of time. Microseconds sometimes. So you need automatic protection to help you out. <clears throat> but some things take longer. The, most of the big blackouts evolved over several minutes to hours. So there is time to do something. But the point is, things are changing. And you're monitoring it, hopefully, and doing some analysis to see what should we do. Once you have gotten everything to settle down, then you have to put the grid back together. So that usually means adding some load back in that somehow got disconnected, adding a line back in that got switched out, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get back to the normal state. <clears throat> okay, contingencies are considered both in planning and operations. So I call it operational reliability, but you also, when you're planning a new grid for the year 2030, you have to propose all the contingencies for the year 2030. So both planners and operators use this stuff. What are the causes of contingencies? Here's my favorite list. Uh, of course, ice storms, uh, lightning, tree growth. That was a 2003 instigating problem. Uh, the trees grew into the wires and created a short circuit. The insulation could fail because it's old. Uh, squirrels and snakes, they're, uh, they're uh, really sneaky creatures, and they go where they're not supposed to go, and they cause short circuits. Uh, bad maintenance, mistakes, somebody forgetting to take something off, uh, sabotage, disgruntled employees and terrorists, uh, cascading outages, one thing causes another, that causes another, and then, of course, there's always the hackers, the cyber people, and we know about this from the Crimean uh, incident, uh, and we'll hear more about it, I'm sure, in the future. What does it mean to survive a contingency? I said you have to survive it. It means that you have to check three things, usually. You gotta check the thermal limit. Nothing can be overloaded. <clears throat> You're not burning up anything. Nothing is outside of an acceptable range. For example, uh, the current. The current has to be below a certain amount on every line. It could be a voltage problem. You need good voltage. Actually, I've, I've said this before. I get in trouble a little bit when I say it because <clears throat> it's not exactly the right thing we want you to think about. Really what you pay for in your electric bill is voltage. That's what you want, right? You want a voltage. If you've got a voltage, you're happy. So, Megawatts and the kilowatt hours, what, what is that? I mean, that's not even something you can touch. But a voltage you could touch. You wouldn't want to touch it if it's a big one. But a voltage you can measure and monitor very easily right there in your house. If you don't have a voltage, you've got a blackout. So voltage is an important quantity, and the criteria is rated voltage plus or minus 5%. Stability. All generators have to remain in synchronism. If we're talking about a synchronized grid, that means the speeds are near the equivalent for 60 hertz. We use mathematical models for all three of these things. It comes in two forms, static or dynamic. Static contingency analysis is really just looking at steady state solutions. If you outage a line, where did the current go and what happened? 
that's steady state. So there, there's no disturbance really other than that. There's no fault, there's no short circuit, there's nothing that's causing things to change. <coughs> Commercial software, this was all developed in the 60s, PSSE, that's primarily uh, GE in uh, New York created. PSLS was GE, and actually I criticized them, I don't, I don't criticize them, I accuse them of stealing my acronym. When I was a graduate student in 1974, I think it was, I had a box of IBM cards, actually not one, about three boxes of IBM cards under my desk, and it said PSLF on the side. That stood for Pete Sauer Lotlo. And then along came GE, and they called their software PSLF. Stand is for positive sequence load flow. It just means everything's balanced, and it's a nice, easy load flow problem. But anyway, also we have ABB, of course, Alstom, Siemens, OSII, uh, Power World is the uh, vendor. What are the calculations? I wanted to give you a little bit of a feeling for the math. We use, of course, fundamental stuff. I equals YZ. That's Ohm's law upside down in matrix form. Same as V equals IR, only it's matrices and it's admittance instead of resistance. So these are vectors, but for every current in that vector, there is a power, and the power is the voltage times the conjugate of the current. These are all complex numbers. Those quantities are in rectangular form, P plus JQ. P is the real power, kilowatt hours, you pay for those. Reactive power is the foam on the beer. That's the stuff you don't pay for, it's free. But you can't take too much of it or you'll have to pay. The result of this is that it's a nonlinear problem with multiple solutions. And my favorite explanation of those multiple solutions are, if you're using S equals VI conjugate product, and you say that S is zero, that means VI equals zero. There are two possible answers. Either the voltage is zero and the current is not, or the current is zero and the voltage is not. But if you think about it, those are both physically possible, right? An open circuit means there's no load at all, nothing's connected. A short circuit means that everything is shorted out, which is really bad. But if you wanted to do that, you could do that. So these mathematical equations have multiple solutions, and unfortunately, they're possible. They're not just anomalies that pop up. And not a lot of people would even agree with me about that, but you can't argue with this. This proves that it's possible. And I'll just leave it there. Uh, the linear solution that we use, if everybody's heard of large change sensitivities, large change means you open up a line. That's not some little epsilon perturbation. You open up a line, that's a big change. But those of you that have had some circuits know that there's a thing called large change sensitivities. Others that have had circuits will say, oh, that's just a current divider. You open up a line, that current has to go somewhere. It's going to go to parallel paths, paths of least resistance or impedance. So that idea of large change sensitivities is really valuable for us because we can do loss of a line and see how it redistributes and we can use linear algebra for that, not the nonlinear full-blown load flow. Now, it's not quite exactly right, but it's okay. It's really quick. Now, here's an example of that. I have the west and the east. This is kind of like a demo that we did for the blackout. This is a generator maybe in the western part of the eastern grid, which would be Iowa, Kansas, all those people. 
And the east is New York City and Florida, all those combined. And I show six transmission lines. The little red boxes are circuit breakers, the circles are generators, and the arrows are the loads. And if you look at the numbers, the loads are the same in both cases, totaling 12,000 megawatts. But look at the one on the west is 9,000, one on the east is 3,000. The east is expensive, the west is cheap. So there's a 6,000 a 6, megawatt transfer from the west to the east. 6,000 divided among six lines. Uh, I'm sorry, I take it back. It's not a it's not a $6,000 transfer. It's a 3,000 3,000 megawatt transfer to get that 6,000 up to nine. It divides evenly. This, the lines are all the same. So you get 500 megawatts per line times six is 3,000. And if you look at the reactive power, the reactive power of the east is 1150 megavars. I propose that the rating is 1,200. So it's below the max. And that's important because if it hits the max, that voltage is gonna change from being perfect, 1.0 per unit, to being something worse than that. You can also see that if you add the two bars on the left and the right, the 300 megabars are required by the lines themselves. They're inductive components. Okay, take out one line. That 500 megawatts has to go somewhere. Well, it redistributes into the other five lines because you're still generating 9,000 and you're still uh, transferring 3,000 over here to the east. But the loading on those lines went up from 500 to 600. The VAR requirement <coughs> here in the east went up to 1186, <coughs> but 1186 is still less than 12. So the, jet, the voltage is still one. So everything's still fine. Take out a second line. That power gets transmitted, still 3,000, but it's 750 per line now. The VARs that it takes over here to keep the voltage at one has hit the limit at 1,200. So it's right at the edge of losing control of the voltage. And other than that, everything is okay. But that's still okay. I mean, one per unit is good, right? And we're just assuming that they're not thermally overloaded. Take out a third line. Yeah. Good question. So why is the VAR requirement going up when you take out a line? So, so why does the... Okay. Good question. Because the VAR requirement of the lines is I squared X. The lines are lossy. They have I squared R, which is money. They also have I squared X, because they're inductive. Well, um, because of that square, it goes up. Because the current is, go is going over there. For example, now the current, I don't know, is 1,000 mega, mega amps per line. You square that, you're going to get more than four. Okay, so this is still at its bar limit. It can't produce any more than 1,200. That's all it's got. The voltage is starting to go down because of that. Now, over there on the west side, there is no limit. We call that an infinite bus. It can put out as many as you want. Take out four lines. Now we're getting pretty serious. The transfer is now 1,500 megawatts per line. There's only two left. We're still at a bar limit here. The voltage is going down, it's 0.97, but that's only 3%, that's not bad. The West is an infinite bus, so it keeps producing extra bars to make up for the losses. Take out five lines, or try to. 
If you do this simulation with five lines out, Newton's method doesn't converge. And so there is no solution to this case. You cannot, trans you cannot transmit 3,000 megawatts over one line in this case. And I'll talk about that later. So this is a case where you have actually lost equilibrium. You can't do it. And that would, that would be captured by some relay somewhere. Okay. Now dynamics. Loss of stability is what might happen as a result of this. That means that generators lose synchronism with each other and they start to slip poles. And that's a big no-no in our business. Uh, so the, they will trip on a loss of out-of-step relay. Same commercial software. The calculations are the same. You still need all of these steady state equations. But you have to add to them all the dynamic equations associated with the generators and their control systems. So you need to do numerical simulation. It's hard to use uh, Lyapunov stuff. Uh, people have tried for years, but the industry keeps going back to numerical integration. Just integrate the dynamics and see what happens. And part of that is because when you do a simulation from time zero to 10 seconds, you want to just not just watch the, the angle swings and the speed swings. You want to check the voltages. Because if the voltages go down during that 10 second period, they could cause a lot of power electronic stuff to trip and be gone, and you'd lose those. So the voltage is just as important as the synchronism. And so you, and you can't really just say, well, it's going to remain stable. Stable isn't enough. It has to be stable, and the voltages have to be okay the whole time. And how do you do that analytically? You can't. You have to just integrate and look at the numbers. Now, you might use some fancy uh, situational awareness techniques to make that process easier, but you still have to use numerical integration. Okay, situational awareness is a big one. Uh, what are we watching? We're looking at system frequency. We look at the voltage magnitudes. From that, we, from PTs, PT stands for potential transformer. We look at current flow in lines. We use a CT for that, current transformer. These are not little ones. These are big things. They're two, three feet yeah. in dimension. Uh, a circuit breaker static. Like a big server bolt. The PTU, maybe three. Survey, you're not, you're not muted, bud. Muted now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we just muted you, uh, Sergey. Uh, uh, I was just pointing out the FCL device, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Circuit breaker status is a big deal. Is a line open or closed? You, you may think that's simple, but if you're an operator in a control room, you don't know what's what. And that was a big problem in the New York blackout of 77, I think it was. And they thought a line was out because it registered as zero megawatt flow. But it wasn't zero megawatt flow because the line was out. It was just zero because there wasn't any flow. And that caused confusion. So we monitor the status of breakers. We monitor the position of tap changing under load transformers, TCULs. And the phase angles is a fairly modern thing to do. Monitor those angles on the voltages and the current. It's not so obvious what we're going to do with that measurement, but it's nice to sit and look at it and say, aha, I know what it is. I know the angle on all the bus voltages, and I know the angles on all the currents. What you do with that is, is yet to be uh, decided. Uh, measurement sensors can have errors. You could have a broken <coughs> sensor. You could have a time skew. You know, to do this stuff, we want everything to be done at exactly the same instant. Otherwise, it doesn't really mean anything. So you have to avoid all time skews. 
And we're going to do this every five seconds. Refresh the SCADA screen every five seconds. And then we want to do an estimation of the real grid condition. And we want to do that about every five minutes. So every five minutes, we want to see what is the status of the grid. Well, we're not going to believe the sensors because they have errors. So we do state estimation. And we also do bad data detection. So if a, if a sensor is broken, we can find out because we'll see that the data is bad. And that, all of that stuff is part of a thing called state estimation. It's also part of observability and redundancy, but I'm not going to get into that stuff. Instead, I'll just go through something quick that I think most people know about. Weighted least squares. Weighted least squares is a, a way to, it's like curve fitting almost, or whatever, however you want to think of it. Uh, Z is equal to H of X plus W. Z are the measurements, X are the states, and W is noise or error. So H is just the relationship between the states and the measurements. For example, if the, if the measurement is a bus voltage, then the H of X is just the voltage at that bus. There's no H, really. It's just the voltage voltage. But Z could be a line flow. And how is the megawatt line flow related to the states, which are the voltages? That's a nonlinear function, H of X. Now let me just do a simple linear case. If you linearize that H of X around a point, then you get capital H, which is linear, and you want to minimize the sum of the squares weighted by the error. <coughs> R, R is the inverse of this covariance matrix. R is the covariance matrix, and you use the inverse of that. And that's what we want to minimize. And here's the solution. Everybody has done this, I think, once or twice <coughs> in their lives. The solution there is the x hat, and it involves the inverse of a bunch of stuff, but it's a very straightforward thing to do. It's linear, and you can easily derive that solution. <coughs> the point is here that the residue, or the residual of the measurement is Z, the measurement, minus H of X because that's what it's supposed to be, right? H of X is supposed to give you Z. So if you have an estimate of X, you put it in H and compare it to Z, the measurement. Well, if the residual is too big, then the data is bad. The Z is not correct because the state is assumed to be right, and you get H of X and compute the Z. If it doesn't match, maybe you throw it away. There have been a lot of papers. Uh, Rakesh Boba and I were working on one involving fake data by hackers into the state estimation problem with the purpose of confusing the operator. But you had to stay under the radar. Radar is that residual. If the residual gets too big, we're just going to throw it away. So if you change a number by too much, it's not going to bother us. We'll just throw it away, and we'll still get the right state estimate. So there had to be ways to not be caught as bad data and yet change the numbers so that it confuses people. And there are, there are certain simple problems that you can do that. You can change numbers, and the operator won't know that you did because it won't change the residuals. Yeah, we. Because uh, when we you uh, let's not, not think about uh, attacks, but when you have the bad data and it's moving, and you do the uh, do the like the state estimation again, but what if you're removing too many bad data that you cannot uh, cannot perform the state estimation? Oh, because you lose observability. You don't have enough measurements. You yeah. don't have enough redundancy. Yeah. Yeah, that could happen. So what we what do we do? Okay, well, then you just believe the SCADA. <laughs> you can always just believe the SCADA. I mean, the SCADA is right in front of you. The only question is... How much it's lying to you. Right. <laughs> well, those are, those are tough questions. Well, but doesn't, doesn't, doesn't the date, you know, using, using a, uh, the actual measurement, 
Um, well, a couple of points may be okay. If the trajectory radically diverges, then you can go back and do something. But otherwise, it's going to get absorbed in the iterations. So. Yeah, that's right. I mean, things uh, things can be wrong, and everything is still okay, more or less. So if there's something wrong, <coughs> there'll be alarms. Now, if they're fake alarms, you'll find out eventually. If, if they're not, the, the more serious one is if something is really wrong, and you don't get an alarm. That's the more serious problem, but it is possible. So what do you mean by believe the SCADA? Isn't this what the SCADA is telling you? What is? Well, the SCADA is, is giving you a measurement from a device like a, P, a PT or a CT or a watt meter. It's a number that comes in and shows up on your screen. Right. 237 or 12. Open. Do you believe the numbers? Well, most operators do. That's all they look at. They don't care about the state estimation. To them, the SCADA is sacred. It is what the measurements are telling me. I believe them. Everything is either good or bad. There's either alarms or there are not. The state estimation is more for the contingency analysis that's going to be used right after this. But there are some people that say to us, I don't believe this data because it could be bad and I want a state estimator. Truth be told, I think it was probably 20 years before state estimators were even used. I mean, they had them. They just turned them off. Didn't use them. So, so Pete, is it accurate to say that when you say just believe the SCADA, what, what the uh, core assumption there is is that the utility operators treat the SCADA measurements as uh, the root of their assumption. In other words, it's their ground truth. And then everything else, like ACE calculations, ADC, state estimation, et cetera, are potentially errored, but the values are always the, the truth. Yeah, I'll get to those, the, the ACE thing in a second. But it, it's pretty simple. If you're an operator and you're measuring something and it's displayed on your computer, you believe it. You might be wrong. Maybe it is bad, but... Yeah, but the premise of what this research was that you were doing with Rakesh was that you challenged the assumption of can you believe those skater measurements? Yes. How can you root out whether or not the skater measurements are truthful? Right. Not even, I'm not talking the skater. We're talk, well, we're talking the skater. It could be something here. Right. Data so, injection. That's what well, the way, the way we solved the problem of rooting out the hacker is we enforce some constraints that the hacker wouldn't know about. We can check those constraints. You're talking about the impedance work, right? The random perturbation? I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of constraints that we use that we figure the hacker would never know about these. Some of them include, include the bars. And some of the measurements which you have on this screen for the operator, right? They are not straight measurements. They are some aggregate something you did with this measurement. Otherwise, you will have so many numbers that nobody will know what it says. But you don't have a choice. The operator doesn't have a choice. I have to trust it. What can I do? Well, the operator That's does have all those numbers. You can you can dive down into a substation and get everything. If you want the ag just the bulk grid. You can you zoom out and you get just the bulk grid. So let's so say if I have thousands of tens of thousands of transmission lines, you will display for me the load or current on each and every line. Well, How you're probably sitting in Cleveland, Denver. right? I don't know, but let's say if you're sitting in Cleveland and your company owns uh, Cleveland, then you're probably only worried about stuff <coughs> around you. You don't care what's happening in New York. Chicago. But if you want to know, you can find out. But you probably don't care about those. So the answer is the operator can look at as much or as little data as they want to. 
They rely on alarms to tell them when something's wrong. So they often get overwhelmed with alarms. You know, 100 alarms going off. And you gotta figure out why they're going off and what are you gonna do. So they're not gonna sit and stare at a line megawatt flow and make sure it's okay unless they have a real reason to do that. So they don't have to look at all this data. But if they want to, they could. And some do. Some sit there and look at it. It's up there displayed on the wall. So how do you change the number in, let's say, wait, what do you change? You're changing numbers in Z or in X hat? Uh, you throw away a, a bad Z. Okay, so, so the attacker is changing numbers in Z, but is he, yes. is he doing that through attacking SCADA measurements? How is he changing the numbers in Z? She is she. actually doing it, not, <laughs> not he. <laughs> and she is getting into your computers. And I don't know how to do that. You have to ask Tim or Edmund. <laughs> But somehow they're getting into the computer and they're changing the numbers. Okay, but they're not meddling with the SCADA data acquisition systems in this case. Uh, I don't know. It might be. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I could. You could mess with the PMU that is providing the data, or you could mess it down to like, like uh, uh, you know, who he was doing. Now you could mess with the GPS system yeah. and change the. Right. Like, like. Well, but a lot of the state estimation isn't using the PMU values for, for validation and the measurement. That's a big, that's a big discussion. The, the question is, should you use PMU data to make the state estimation better, which it would, or should you use it as a check on the state estimator to see if there's an error somewhere or a hacker? Because the, the, the PMUs give you state measurements. We're doing state estimation. So in principle, if you do, if you have enough PMUs, you don't need a state estimator because you're measuring everything. Now again, it's state measurements. It's like, do you believe it or you don't? Uh, okay, let me let me just keep going here for a minute uh, to get to the control part. There's lots of things that we call control. Most of them don't have uh, H infinity or even PI control, let alone PID control. The controls for the grid are sometimes discrete. You have a circuit breaker that opens up or it doesn't open up, and it, the thing that decides that is the relay. The relay decides when to open up a circuit breaker. We look at things for voltage. We want the voltage to be good, so that's clear. We want the frequency to be good, that's, that's easy. We want the power flow on the lines to be less than the ratings, and we want the generators to all be stable. And there's environmental stuff. We used to call it knots and socks. And this was really popular in the 70s when there was acid rain. Uh, and there are a lot of laws about pollution now that have to be a constraint here. The sensors that we have, frequency meters, PMUs, relays, PTs and CTs, out-of-step relays, will sense that you have lost synchronism. Florida lost synchronism with the eastern grid. That used to happen all the time. Literally, Florida separated away from the eastern interconnect because it couldn't remain stable. When we, whenever we try to connect the east and the west together, synchronously, it never works. We have to open it up. Uh, okay, emissions is another one. Here's, I, I want to go through some, some modeling stuff. There are two traditional automatic controls. By automatic, I mean they're PI and they're automatic continuous, constantly controlling the grid. The two most important things, frequency and voltage. You've got to have 60 hertz, otherwise you're in trouble. you got to have rated voltage, otherwise you're in trouble. So those are the really only the two things that people care about. So I have shown here on the left part all the frequency related stuff. The prime mover is the turbine that turns the shaft to the generator. 
It has a governor built into it, and I'll show you what one looks like in a minute. There's a steam valve that opens and closes the steam. Or you can think of that as the gas pedal on your car, whatever you want to think of it as. But the point is, it's, it's controlling real power, P, and the angles on the voltages. So it's called P theta. If you're familiar with the decoupling in load flow, you have P theta decoupled from QV, reactive power and voltage. Reactive power controls voltage, so it's separate. P is theta, driven. So we separate them as, uh, in load flow, the, the real power part and the reactive power part. So this, this diagram is also split in two. The governor, the turbine, the steam valve are on the left. The synchronous machine exciter, which is the source of the magnetic field for the rotor. And the automatic voltage regulator, the AVR, controls the voltage of the network. Okay, I have to show you this one just because this is my favorite thing, and this is what we call a detailed model of a synchronous machine. For the most part, it's just a circuit with a controlled source. Now, this one is really complicated because it includes the field winding, the damper winding, and then Newton's second law there at the bottom. All right, here's a simpler one. You can make an argument how to change that first one to be this one. And we do it all the time when we want something easy to use. This captures the fundamental idea of synchronism and stability. It's nothing but a damped pendulum. If you know what a pendulum is, and you try to keep it up at the top, that's unstable. Down is stable, up is unstable. The same thing is true of the synchronous machine. So we use what's called a damped pendulum model or the classical model. And in order to change this with some controls, we need to change the set point of the power. The TM is the torque going into the, tur into the shaft. That control is the output of this. The input is the set point PC. So there's a command power, P, but then there's an automatic part. If the frequency gets too high, omega is bigger than omega s. That's a positive number. Times a minus sign is a negative number. It will, it will shut the steam valve. Because if the frequency is too high, the machine is turning too fast. So it will shut the steam valve down, which in turn shuts down the torque to the generator. So the one on the right there, the RD, that's the droop. That's the automatic control of the governor. If you go too fast, it's going to slow you down. Here's what I've got. I, I had to show this because this is one of my favorite diagrams. Uh, you can look at it on the slides later on. But if you follow all these uh, linkages, you can see how it shuts the valve or opens the valve. And this came out of a book by Ali Elgard. Uh, which I used when I was a brand new grad student, and my advisor made me work every problem in the book. Uh, there are what I would call five or six steps here. The first one is the inertia response. You know, when you when you turn on a light, you're going to cause something to slow down. It has to. And when that happens, the governor will react and open up the steam valve and get more steam in which brings the speed back up. So when you turn on a light, you're slowing down a generator. The governor will detect that because of the change in frequency, and it will increase the steam valve to make it go faster. That's the primary control, the governor. The inertia is just the automatic stuff, the speed of light. Speed of light to create the torque that causes the change in speed and the inertia that's not speed of light. The inertia has a time delay. But the secondary control then is called AGC, low frequency control, LFC. AGC is a combination of load frequency control and economic dispatch. So the load frequency control is the area control error, 
ACE. And the economic dispatch is how you should do it for the cheapest possible cost. When you put the ACE together with the, the economic dispatch, you have what's called ADC, Automatic Generation Control. Uh, there are NERC standards for all these things, and I'm showing them there if you want to look at them. Tertiary control is later on, uh, you readjust the, the generation to make it optimal. And then finally, time control. If the system remains too slow for too long, the clocks will go slow. Now, I'm not sure modern clocks would, would but the old clocks used to. Okay, here's ATC. Area control error is a very famous quantity in, in power <coughs> system operations. It stands for area control error. And there are two different types of ACE. And the United States, or well, the whole world, the whole world does not all use the same definition. There's two different definitions. There's the what have you done definition. And then there's the what should you do definition. The what have you done definition says that if the ACE is positive, you're putting in too much power. That's the what have you done. And you better slow it down. So if the ACE is positive, using that definition, it means you better slow down. If it's negative, that means you don't have enough power being generated. You better speed it up. As opposed to the what should you do definition, which is just the reverse. If the ACE is positive, you should increase the generation. So uh, the NERC definition goes by the first one. But there are some operators in the world that use the second one. There are some textbooks, Wooden Wallenberg for one, which uses the other one. I don't know why. Uh, well, I sort of do. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to use the first one because that's the NERC standard. Uh, if if, if um, the, the uh, frequency of the current goes far beyond what ADC is capable of, then something else kicks in? I don't know that it can <laughs> ever quit. It will always continue to give you the signal to increase until something else blows. Uh, I mean, that's there is no, well, there's the only last resort stuff like circuit breaker, opening, tripping, things that have caused blackouts. So tripping is still an option beyond. Uh, well, tripping will automatically happen. There's under frequency relays, for example. If the frequency drops to 59.0, that's 60. These relays are pre-programmed. The hacker, hacker can change them pre-programmed to trip and drop load. In the 2003 blackout, they could have stopped the blackout by disconnecting Cleveland. The mayor of Cleveland said, you're not going to trip my city while I'm still alive. <laughs> and so they were not allowed to disconnect Cleveland. If they had, they probably would never have had the blackout. But they kept Cleveland, and it dragged down the whole Eastern Interconnect and Canada. So there are automatic things and there are manual things. And yeah, there are some last resort, but. So just a quick question. So, where yeah. is that 59 uh, defined which document? Is that a NERC document? Like, if I wanted to cite a document that, that specified that threshold? And it's probably in NERC somewhere. Okay. It doesn't, it's not just one, it's a whole. It's like 59.8, 59.6, 59 59.2. You drop a little more as you go as you get worse. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. So for for something like a drop to 59.7, you'd probably only drop uh, CSL. Okay. If you go down to 59.6, you drop all of U of I. If you go down to 59.0, you drop all of Urbana Champagne. It's that kind of thing. I wanted to give you an actual simulation of this because it's kind of fun. 
so I'm going to use again two generators, one area. This is the simplest possible system I can think of. Here's all the initial conditions. You don't have to read them. If you want them, they're on the slides. So if you want to duplicate what I did here, just get this slide and look at all the numbers. Here's the answer. I increased the load in area at bus generator number two by 0.1 megawatts. It was five, I think, and I increased it to 5.1, the load. That change in load created an error in the ACE, which was then integrated to get the Z variable. The Z variable is the integral of ACE, minus, integral of minus ACE. And you can see how the ACE dropped down, which meant you need more, right? If ACE goes negative with the NERC definition and it's minus, it means you've got to add more. So the answer was to increase the power set point for both generator one and generator number two. Generator, one of those is cheaper than the other one. I don't remember which it is, but there's a, a power a participation factor where it allocates the generation to the cheaper one or the expensive one. <clears throat> I should mention, I must admit right here, I know Fortran, and I, but I don't have a compiler. I don't know MATLAB, I don't know C, so I programmed this in Excel. I'll admit that, <laughs> just to show you how easy this is. All we're doing is solving some differential equations, and I'm using Euler's method with a time step of 001. And I'm running it out for, I think, five seconds. So that's, if you think about it in terms of each line of Excel, it's 001 seconds. I had to copy my equations, I think, 5,000 times. But that's how easy Excel is to program. You can program all those equations in there, in the cells of Excel. So I did it, and I admit it, but I was, I was under pressure to get this simulation done in a couple of days. I didn't want to burden some student to do it for me, so I just did it myself, and I used Excel. Okay. And you can use Excel, too. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, automatic voltage regulation is the next control. I'm not going to go through it. It controls the voltage by changing the exciter voltage, EFD, the top one there. The error signal is, is determined here. V ref minus VT looks at the error, then it amplifies it by KA, feeds it into a control system, which eventually opens up EFD or closes it depending on whether you want to go up or down. Now, voltage control, there's a lot of other ways. There's generator excitation control. That's the one I just talked about. There's also tap change. You're going to load transformers. The taps change to give you higher voltage or lower voltage. There's switch reactors. Light load, you switch a reactor in because you lost all the industry. <coughs> Uh, at heavy load, you want capacitors instead. And there's things called static bar compensators, which are just like capacitors and inductors. And there's FACTS, flexible AC transmission system. These are big wire power electronics. We're talking thousands of volts, thousands of amps going through transistors. Uh, it's big wire power electronics. Okay, here's a example of some of that. There's a, a popular thing now called topology control. We, it used to be sacred. You don't open up a line. It's wear and tear on the circuit breakers. It causes a big disturbance that wears on the grid. So you were not allowed to open or close the transmission line unless it was an emergency. Well, that's all changed. An old student of mine now is a CEO of his own company as a result of an RPE project, and they, they do topology switching. They switch out lines in and out all the time to 
change the flows. You know, if you think about it, it's a it's a current divider kind of thing. You you switch in a line, switch out a line, it changes the impedances. This is a little picture here of high voltage DC. There's a picture of a human being standing there. There's the human right there. And this is the high power, big wire power electronics, which creates 500,000 volts DC to AC and back. Uh, stability, I won't go through this. You can if you want to, it's kind of fun. We have a thing called equal area criteria, which on this diagram says that if you're operating at this line called PM and you lose, uh, have a short, that lowers the voltage and that lowers the power output down to this bottom curve, which has a maximum of PM2. And then you want to clear it. You want to get rid of that short circuit, but you're going to only come back up to this line, PM1. The answer is <coughs> area over here has to be bigger than or equal to the area here. And that's fun to go that theory way. And we call it equal area criteria. We do it in our machines lab on the grass. Load shedding, I did that already. Fax devices. Did that already, islanding. You can always open up every tie line and disconnect yourself from the grid. And people have thought about that during blackouts. Why didn't you just disconnect yourself from the grid? And the answer is always, well, we wanted to help the grid. So we stayed in. And then they wound up going down. Anyway, uh, there are some other things. Remedial action schemes. RAS schemes, also known as special protection systems. These are things that you could do, but you're not going to do them unless you really need it. So they are predefined disturbances and your reaction to that disturbance. And it, it involves arming the device, which means you arm it. It's like pulling the trigger back, but you don't pulling the thing, the thing back, but you don't pull the trigger. You have a, a trigger the condition. Something bad happens. Then you actually operate the control scheme. Now, examples of these kind of control schemes are uh, breaking resistors. If you have a fault, the generator starts to accelerate because the voltage is low, the power out is negligible. The generator will blow apart if you don't slow it down. So there's a bunch of these big breaking resistors around the United States. Big resistors. I'm talking uh, five-story building tall type resistors. Their purpose is just to be a big load and slow down the unit. Another one is, uh, I won't worry about the other one. Okay, switch capacitors. You can switch a capacitor in the line. It, it can control, it can take more power because the power flow limit is 1 over x. So if you make x smaller by putting a capacitor in series, that increases the capability. So if I may ask uh, at, this, at this moment, I'm seeing some protocols appearing, but what are these protocols? I mean, uh, how are these commands relayed and measurements uh, relayed? There again, I knew, I'm glad you asked that because that's sort of what I started out with. There are lots of protocols. What are they? ICCP is one. But there are probably different things. I'm not a, a communications power type person. We'd have to ask Paul Murda. Oh. He knows. And people like that know. <coughs> So, and so we're not getting the whole story here. Mm -hmm. And I, I freely admit that I have, I have given you the engineer's view of this, not the electrician's view or the, or the IT view. Mm -hmm. Something has to transmit the generation signal from the control room 
to the nuclear plant. What is that? Is that a wireless thing? Is that fiber? Is it transmission lines that are already there? Honest with you, I don't know. I think it's a mixture of all, all those things. And there are different protocols depending on whether it's wireless, whether it's Ethernet, whether it's fiber, whether it's a transmission line, wire that you're using. So they're all different. They're, again, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but we should get somebody here to talk about that. Um, so, Pete, I think part of it too, like the, the um, remedial action schemes, the protection schemes, et cetera, those are pre-coded and they're just enabled or disabled. So those are just control. You know, yeah, they're all local. Systems. They're right. Right. Yeah. In and the same building. with the generation control. Like, a, um, you know, AGC signals come um, via ICCP or, or other things, but the, you know, you're just telling the governor spin up or spin down. So. Yeah, but but this has to go from the control center to the generating station. Right. Okay. Let me try to wrap up since we're already over the hour. Environmental control. All right. One of the big ones is like backup generators. We have a, a gas diesel generator for ECE. You can't run it 24 hours a day. You get in big trouble because you're polluting the air. So you're only allowed to run a diesel engine a certain amount of time per year. And so you have to live with that constraint. Uh, NOx and SOx, that's nitrogen, nitri uh, nitrogen and sulfur oxides. Uh, there are carbon credits. Uh, we have been known, Chicago has been known to buy or sell their credits to Ohio, which means that Ohio gets to pollute itself and pay us money. So in order for them to get the credit to pollute, they have to pay us. So there is a time when Ohio was paying Illinois money so that Ohio could pollute Ohio. It's a very controversial thing, but it is, it is out there. Carbon credits, uh, you can trade them or sell them. Okay, that's, uh, that's enough. Um, so Pete, one, one other real quick statement. The, um, the general architecture for the generators, they get their commands, their direct control commands via DNP3 in most organizations. And those are processed typically from what entities refer to as their communications front end um, or SCADA gateway or front end processor FEP um, that's interfacing with those. So that's talking to the direct generators and then also to the sub control centers that, because there's the master control center, but then some of the organizations have separate control centers for the generation plants depending on size. Yeah, I've heard of that DNP thing. So. Yeah, so a lot of the comps is DNP3 for the, for the specific things you were talking about, just to actuate or not. Okay. And then values coming back, obviously, are DNP3 as well. Okay, quick question online. Anyone? Twice. I, this, this is Stuart Maddock at MIT. I have, I have a really dumb question, and it's possible you may have answered it because some of, the, some of the sound was a little hard to hear. But what is it that causes these rippling failures that bring down the Northeast or brought down Kenya or whatever. Why isn't the system able to segment itself to make it more limited? Is that because the systems that don't have technology you're describing? I'll tell you that if you'll tell me about your castle, your Langley castle. <laughs> well, Mike, next time we have a blackout, we pull, the, we, pull, we pull the drawbridge up, we flood the moat, and we're safe. Okay. And it's not related to Langley, Virginia, right? No, no. Langley, England. Langley, England. Okay. For those of you that didn't know it, go to Stu's website. His castle is on the web. He owns a castle in, in England. Uh, Doesn't everybody? The ripples you're talking about are really started by some kind of a accident. Yep. And then... But what that does is it causes oscillations in the generators. And if they lose synchronism, which did happen in New York, they trip on a, on a reverse power relay 
or an out-of-step relay, and the generator is protected. We don't want to ruin it. So we, yep. it's disconnected. And then that causes another ripple. That causes uh, a change in the, in the injections, which causes other generators to start oscillating, and then they go unstable. So it's a, it's a cascading thing. And after the 67 blackout, I think it was 67, 65. I think 1965 was the first one. 1977 was the second one. They finally figured it out that they needed to use under frequency relaying to shed load to save the system. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of things that can cause the ripples, but the most common is a short circuit. Well, I, just, I understand the cause. I understand the cause is something like a short circuit, or the, I guess the, the lines froze from uh, from uh, Canada into the U.S. But the question is, why does a localized phenomenon cause such a nationwide or regional-wise effect? That was my real question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, a lot of that could be coordination. The the protection system is pretty basic. It mm. just measures current and takes an action uh, based on what a local measurement is. Yeah. And every relay has zones, like zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. And the zones spread out geographically. So the relay will impact a larger area depending on whether it's set to go off in zone one, two, three, or four. And if that stuff isn't properly coordinated, and it has to be properly coordinated for every possible accident, so it's not easy. But I would say that the, the cause for these things to cascade like that is that they're not coordinated for that particular disturbance. And I don't know the answer to that. The people have said we should redo the entire protection system so that we calculate what is the best thing to do. Given, given this condition, what should we do? Well, oh, I, that's right, you have uh, five microseconds to decide. Yeah. Because stuff here is the speed of light, and so you have to pre-program everything. And you do your best to try to cover every case, but you can't, co you can't think of everything. That's probably the okay. best answer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, well, we're over time, so let's, uh, let's just thank the speaker.